Now I'd like to invite on stage our keynote speaker, Mr. Saunak Wright, General Manager of Few LNG. Please. It's a great honor and great pleasure to be in front of you all of you today morning. And uh, the subject of climate change means more we talk about it, better it is. Because 100 years from now, people will, historians will look at this period, this period when you and me are talking and discussing as the inflection point for Earth. And I hope that they don't remember us for being the people who did nothing, who didn't play their part in saving humanity. Earth will survive, mind you. Earth has survived over millions of years. It's not a question of save the Earth. It's saving the existence of humanity on Earth by saving what is there, what we cherish, what we enjoy here in Earth. So what you see on the screen is not today's lunch. I've been informed that today's lunch is very sumptuous, quite tasty. But what is its significance of this picture with climate change? Earlier this month, there was a big uproar in Australia because KFC decided to change the lettuce in their sandwich to cabbage. Why? Because there was floods in North, North South Wales in Queensland and no lettuce was produced. And there was logistical issues of shipping lettuce from other parts to Australia. This is not one single case. Earlier in the year, McDonald's couldn't give you medium or large French fries. Before that, in UK, McDonald's couldn't deliver milkshakes because there was no milk. All these isolated issues have a connection. And the connection is climate change. Australia, interestingly, has been in the last 20 years, has seen 20% more floods, close to 100% more droughts, and three times more tornadoes or more cyclones. And this is not an isolated story in Australia. All over the world, we are seeing this. World in the last 30 years has seen an increase of one and a half degrees temperature. It is predicted by the middle of the century, 2050, this will reach three degrees higher. I was yesterday hearing a radio session for BBC, and they said that if it grows to four degrees higher, clouds stop to form. Clouds have a dual purpose, not only rain, they actually protect, you know, protect the earth from radiation and reflect a lot of heat back into the universe. And if clouds stop to form, there will be an eight percent or eight degree increase in temperature. So when we are looking at when we touch the four degree, it actually means we are reaching 12 degrees in a very short time. So yes, there's an immediate need to talk about climate change and our, our efforts or our impact on the climate. The issue is further exaggerated by the recent war we are, all have been talking about, we all know about, the Russia-Ukraine war. Interestingly, it's a very interesting thing to know that this picture which you're seeing now is not of the war. It's, it is of Ukraine, but before the war, 2020. Ukraine was considered one of the most polluted nations in the European area, in the European region, even before the war. 70% of all power produced in a big industri industrial nation like Ukraine was fossil, fossil. And the situation has become worse by this war, almost close to 100,000 acres of green area has been destroyed due to the war in Ukraine. But when you look at it, is the Russia-Ukraine war good or bad for climate? Well, I gave you an introduction that sounded bad. And yes, today, because Russia has so much of production of oil and gas, when that production gets, or that movement of that energy source gets restricted, what happens is people scamper to find on a short term other energy resources. And unfortunately, on a short term, these energy resources are actually more damaging to the environment. I'm talking about 
the famous thing in our industry, coal is king. Even in Europe, you could see a big scampering for coal. They are going and importing more LNG, but the infrastructure is not enough to use that LNG and bring this LNG as gas to the power plants. So they are moving towards coal. Even in Asia, there's a big impact where when all the LNG in the market gets absorbed towards Europe, Asia cannot buy that high price LNG and they go towards coal. Over a short term, yes, it's a negative, very negative impact. However, if you look at long term, if you look at European policy now, they have said that the plan B, they will invest more and more on renewable resources. They want to be less and less dependent on oil and gas coming from Russia. In other words, oil and gas in general. So the jury is still out, whether this is good for climate or a bad for climate, but most of the experts agree that on a long-term basis, this may not be bad for the climate. It may actually accelerate the use of renewable sources for power, for energy, for ships, fuel. So now we come to, like this is the marine conference, we are talking about marine things. So let's look at what's the impact of shipping on these emissions. On the left side, there is this fantastic graph which shows which industry emits how many billion metric tons of CO2. Can anyone look at the graph and say, how much does shipping do? To be true, it's not there in the graph. Why? Because shipping is one of the most efficient ways of transporting goods in the world. The global emissions of shipping in 2022 but close to 2.2%. So although it's a very small amount, although it's very efficient, if you look at the graph on the right, it's still sizable. Graph on the right is showing in 2020, from 1990 to 2020, so last 30 years, what was the emissions from, sea, uh, from shipping? And you can see as the global trade increase, As the global trade increases, the emissions from shipping increase exponentially. And if you don't do it, of course, you can see a dip in the end, but that dip is COVID caused and that has changed now again in 2022. If we do not do anything, if we do not take an action, this is going to continue. And IMO predicts that if we don't do anything, these emissions can rise up to 250% more by 2050. So then we will have the glorious opportunity to be on the graph on the left. You don't do anything. But what is being done? IMO is working closely with all the international countries and all with UNO and specifying requirements for emissions in shipping. They've brought in restrictions on design of shipping. You all know. This is one of the most august gatherings, a lot of naval architects, by bringing in design requirements in EEXI, and then going a step earlier uh, ahead and putting up a requirements for operations, operations efficiency, like CII. What does this do is calculates one ton of cargo for moving at a distance, how efficient you are in moving. They put you in a scale from A to E, E being the worst scale and A being the best. And then they say every year we will tighten this scale more and more. Right now they're saying by 2%. And the companies or the ships which are at the E would be would have to come towards C or lower within a period of one to three years. They have to show a plan. And they will be, make more and more un, un, unattractive to a charter if you are a ship which is at the E level. One of the good ways of making a solution for this. There are various ways. You can slow down the ship. You can carry less cargo. Both are actually in the end not efficient. Other one is to change your fuel which you are using, which has been a very area of focus for a lot of ship owners. So today, we are not talking about the world of single fuel. The days of sailing when the fuel was burned, the days of coal, when coal was king, and the deal was fuel oil, the single most important fuel in marine, is finishing. Now more and more, just like the Marvel movie, Multiverse of Madness, we are looking at a new IMO movie, Multiverse of Marine Fuel. 
there are a lot of options available. There is so much information available. There are various ways and there are various pathways. These are few pathways to go to a net zero world in 2050. There's one oil pathway, which most of the ships are following about 105,000 ships in the world, uh, basically following this oil pathway. You have scrubbers with HFO. You can change over to LS HFO and MGO. And uh, then you can proceed to have biofuels. A lot of testing has been carried out for biofuels. Uh, advantage, conventional vessels, mature technology, a vast infrastructure. This advantage is not green. Biofuels still being developing. Biofuels is a live fuel. You keep it in the tanks of the ship, it changes. So quite interesting uh, thing is they do not know what happens to this fuel if you keep it for a longer period. Uh, the live organisms in the fuel may actually change the fuel to something very new or very different. It may damage the engine also. That is something being researched in the area. The other pathway which I follow or I represent is LNG pathway. We have fossil LNG today, 22 to 28% saving in CO2 emissions. And going ahead, we have liquefied biomethane, like e methane, which are basically taking you to the net zero path. Advantages, dual fuel LNG technology, which is mature technology, expanding infrastructure. Disadvantages, we will look into it a little bit. Methane slip, there is still carbon in LNG, so it needs to be thought about that. A new pathway, methanol pathway, you've seen musk ordering methanol ships, very interesting. Fossil methanol, presently available. Future of green fuel is green methanol. The engine technology is available. The infrastructure for distribution of fuel is quite native, quite early days for that. Uh, and then some other advantages and disadvantages, we'll just look in, in a while. Then there is a hydrogen pathway, a very popular, thing to discuss, a very interesting thing to discuss. However, a lot of time being discussed by people who have not actually worked in these trades and do not know the entry cases. Uh, gray ammonia and gray hydrogen, which are available today, are actually more polluting than fuel oil. Green hydrogen, green ammonia, of course, net zero fuels, very good fuel, not available presently, technology is being developed. The engines to use them, I don't have to tell you, you guys are all experts in ship building, uh, ship design. Not there. Not even there for green ammonia and green hydrogen. Uh, green, gray ammonia and gray hydrogen. The immature technology infrastructure is not existing, but that is something we have to work in 2050, till 2050. There's a time to bring in this technology. There's a time. To so if you quickly compare, or before we compare, we have to forget. There's a very interesting in our agenda, the last item. And I would also like to highlight that last item. Yes, the nuclear pathway. Very, very interesting to include it in your agenda today because, yes, when we were using and talking about nuclear ships in the past, we all talked about a fuel which was low enriched uranium with a big issue of waste, nuclear waste, with a big issue of getting a disaster. Also that how that technology can be transferred and used for weapons. A lot of questions around nuclear shipping. Today's technology, and I hope we will be hearing more about it during the agenda, today, during the conference today. There are new developments. There is something called a molten salt thorium reactor. Doesn't use uranium, uses thorium, which cannot be used to make weapons, as I heard here. And uh, basically you build a ship, you bunker it once and that's it. And then you don't need to do anything in lifestyle, in lifestyle. And there is no nuclear waste once you have used the nuclear fuel. Quite interesting technology. The issues, again, we can talk all good about nuclear, but there's always that stigma which is attached because of the nuclear disasters which has happened in the past. Would a country like Singapore or Hong Kong allow a nuclear fuel ship? Questions. I don't have the answer to the questions. Is it green? Probably yes. Emission free? Probably yes. Uh, social acceptance, regulatory acceptance? Questions. Again, it is a pathway. It is something which is being discussed now.
this is my last slide. Uh, how do these alternate fuels stack up? So if you look at it, LNG is a fuel which is ready. Today, 35% of the new build tonnage on order uses LNG as fuel. Advantage is immediate GHG reduction, non-toxic. And using biomethane and emethane, you have a pathway which goes up till 2050. So if you order a ship today, you have solutions which are technologically tested and available in the market, which will allow you to use the ship until 2050, which is quite, quite interesting. Challenges there are, firstly, it's a cryogenic fuel handled at minus 160 degrees. So needs that training, needs that infrastructure to manage it. And a lot of discussion around methane slip. So that needs to be reduced because methane itself is a GHG gas. Uh, the other fuels, uh, green hydrogen, again, the readiness is not there. The technology readiness is also not there and infrastructure readiness is not there. So it's red and all green, it's not available. The good part is it's carbon free. Good part, it's synergized with other sectors. Hydrogen can be used. I mean, talked about using all other sectors like power and car fuel also. And it's non toxic, non -toxic so it's not dangerous. Highly explosive, needs a lot of storage. The energy density is quite low and it's a low ignition. Energy. There's a chance of explosion, so that needs to be considered. And uh, more importantly, low level of neutralization. Green ammonia, again, carbon free, non cryogenic, so easy can be easily used. Uh, challenges highly toxic. I was looking at a report from DNV. Uh, DNV worked with the uh, port of Amsterdam to see if ammonia can be bunkered in Amsterdam. One of the interesting things they found was the focus area for toxicity for ammonia. It's 2.6 kilometers if you're doing well in the So yeah, highly toxic. We need to find a solution to the toxicity. It's not a good fuel. It's a poor fuel. So needs a lot of pilot fuel. Presently, I think tests are being done to use 30% pilot fuel and 70% ammonia for ammonia to be burnt in engines. Probably a better solution is to use ammonia in fuel cells that's been looked into. Then green methanol has been talked about. Good carbon neutral fuel. Again, it's a liquid at ambient temperature. You don't need to look at cryogenics. Mildly toxic, it's toxic to marine environment. So hopefully it doesn't land up in water. Again, for making green methanol, same as green hydrogen, green ammonia, and e-methane, you need a CO2 source, which is biological or from direct air capture. I don't you know, you must have all heard about DSCC, direct air carbon capture. So you need a source from where you can capture the carbon directly. Uh, the lower, the energy density of methanol is lower, but one more four times, you need a about 40% more storage than what you would have if an energy tank is. So overall, if you look at the fuels, and again, I would repeat, there's no one single answer for the future. All of them would be having a role eventually at times when the technology develops. Presently, when we look at it, LNG provides a safe and reliable pathway, which is tested. And for the next 30 years, we can count on it and be used for net zero So with that note, I would like to okay. really need to learn how to use this thing. So thanks a lot. Uh, I welcome you all on this conference. I have provided you a short snapshot of what climate change is, what is happening. And also I have provided you on the marine side of things, what is happening. Uh, I am not an expert of the entire climate change part of it. Nobody can be. I am an expert in marine fueling part of it. If you have any questions, queries, you're always welcome to ask during today's conference and or later also. Uh, what I am saying, want to emphasize is that doing nothing is not an option. All of us in ways, manners, individually, and in our roles, working for companies or our own companies, we have to move towards a better tomorrow than what is today. And let's try to even a small step, every small step actually has an impact. With that, thank you and have a great conference. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Mr. Sonat Wright, for delivering the keynote speech. So, uh, just to remind uh, all the attendees to ask the question, you can scan the QR code on your table and you can find the Wi Fi network and password on the table as well. So, now, So now I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, Mr. Greg Fisk. He will be joining us online. So he's, he is the Global Lead of Climate Risk and Resilience, BMT Global. And his topic is Physical Climate Change Issues for Marine Time and Industry. Now we are going to session number one, which is about the climate change. Please welcome. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Maybe just a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. Um, hopefully everyone can see and hear this. I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for inviting me to speak today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, the ongoing travel dramas uh, have prevented me from coming up, um, but very, very pleased to be here and um, you know talk about this important topic. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, moving away from decarbonisation and alternative fuels and a lot of the issues that, that the industries uh, are dealing with and talk, uh, take a, a step back to talk about physical risks. Uh, and in particular, why those physical risks are equally important for maritime industries as decarbonisation. Uh, what I'll talk about is definitions and concepts, some drivers and trends, who are the maritime industries affected, uh, how to practically approach risk and resilience and future directions. Um, and, and I think one of the things to realise is, while we all need to do our part, as the previous speaker just said, around mitigation and decarbonisation to, to, to move towards the IMO uh, targets of 50% decarbonisation, to move eventually towards neutrality and net zero with the use of alternative fuels, there has to be a realisation that decarbonisation will not solve all of our climate problems. And we'll still have risks to assets, to operations and workforces from both sort of acute and chronic weather impacts. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, the theme of this conference, sea level rise uh, in the Asia region and the Southeast Asian region. So really what I wanted to cover today is, well, what, is, what are some of the threats? How do we build resilience with a view that it eventually uh, we will need to adapt to a different world. So, you know, I, I'm a scientist. Um, I've done a lot of work in um, sort of climate and, and coastal management uh, over my career. The best way that I try to explain uh, climate to people is um, really it's, a, it's moving that parabola. It's, it's, it's exacerbating the existing extremes that we have. So that's important to understand, you know, we're talking about more hot weather, more extreme weather um, and, and sort of, you know, a, a new paradigm that's more based on the future than the past. And I think the other thing that, that really came out of the recent intergovernmental panel on climate change report uh, at the end of last year was almost a realisation and a resignation that even with aggressive decarbonisation, the effects of extreme weather and climate change are now largely considered, considered inevitable. And we're likely staring down uh, the, the sort of barrel of a 1.5 to 2 degree Celsius increase. Now, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty in the context of, well, depending on the scenario adopt, this is a, a, a graph from that most recent report showing uh, global sea level rise but anywhere between sort of, you know, uh, by 2100, sort of 0.25 up to a metre, uh, certainly um, getting up under certain projections to well over a metre by 2150. And for the first time, IPCC has recognised that we may very well have some cataclysmic events that cause sea level rise uh, to occur even faster, and that could be melting and, and falling of ice sheets um, from either of the poles uh, or impacts on permafrost. 
So certainly the, the, the scientific key message I'd like to get across today is certainly the IPCC is not forecasting it to be better. Um, and, you know, and that's a huge driver for increasing the rate of decarbonisation, but that we're going to have impacts uh, one way or another. Now, in the region, you know, the, the, the municipalities, the, the national governments in the region have started to, to publish what this means at a local scale. Uh, I'm familiar with Singapore's in particular, um, uh, and, and these projections apply to much of the region. But really, you know, it, it's, it's acknowledging that there's observed changes now, which is the top line, and, and what are the future climate projections. So some of those are daily mean temperatures increasing from 1.4 to 4.6 degrees Celsius, certainly a, a higher number of very hot days and warm nights, uh, probably the third one's the, the really important one. Rather than regular rainfall, there'll be uh, sort of monsoonal wet months with a lot of larger storms that cause flash flooding. But then you may very well have uh, longer periods of drought uh, in the dry season. Uh, certainly, Singapore and the region surrounding will be continually influenced by northeast and southwest monsoon conditions. Uh, and then the last one really around a, a, a fairly... Uh, dire projection of uh, a meter of sea level rise by 2100. So faced with that and, and sort of acknowledging these are some headlines from around the region that certainly I've sort of noted down as I, I sort of, you know, uh, work uh, around the world in this space. You know, certainly this is the, the quote on the left is from the, the Singapore government itself, with over 30% of the island being less than five meters above uh, SHD. Any additional increase caused by climate change is an immediate threat. Uh, continuing challenges in Indonesia uh, from a combination of um, flooding as well as um, sort of um, uh, land subsidence. And, and I think the first speaker raised it as well. You know, some of the major cities in the region uh, could have areas uh, underwater, so sort of permanently inundated by tides uh, by 2050. So... Amazingly, uh, I suppose, you know, representing or, or talking about the maritime uh, sector, it's, it's been the financial sector. It's been the first to, to, to jump on the issue of, well, how does climate affect business? Um, and, and they've basically from the end of uh, the 2010s and 2017, the G20 uh, Financial Stability Board published uh, a document called the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And that document uh, embeds that every company should be undertaking some level of risk and opportunity and financial impact assessment of how climate could affect its business. Uh, and it provides a, a global framework that's now being used uh, across the world uh, to do that. Um, that has moved beyond uh, a, a due diligence exercise into a regulatory requirement um, uh, in many countries of the world, including announcements by the Singapore Exchange last year that basically listed companies will need to actually disclose their climate risks to shareholders and financiers. Uh, it's already law in Hong Kong, it's law in New Zealand, uh, it's law in the UK, and there's certainly a number of other sort of um, OECD countries that are moving uh, to, to legislate. So an important sort of driver from the financial community that, that businesses need to take the issue seriously. Now, in terms of industries affected by physical climate risks, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be everyone who has assets or workforces uh, or operations uh, that could be affected. So ports, harbours, shipyards, marinas, commercial shipping, cruise shipping, marine contractors, ferry services and bunkering. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it, it could be that basically there's impacts um, from these acute and chronic impacts on assets. So if it's a shipyard, it could be basically flooding of the shipyard, um, causing damage to the assets. Uh, it could be the need for increased maintenance or repair costs. It could be a temporary loss of use of production um, uh, caused by, say, flooding. It could be increased shipping disasters or claims, particularly in the context of um, sea conditions that are, are, are certainly more unstable. Um, 
if ports are experiencing um, significant climate impacts, again, as the first speaker raised, delays to shipping, inaccessibility and flow on impacts on the supply chain. Uh, and all of these sort of relate to insurers realising that, well, we need to actually escalate our premiums to cover claims. Now, that's sort of the financial built asset side of it. There's also health, safety and environment implications. So loss of life and injuries, um, particularly from, say, very hot days, uh, from increased storminess, lightning storms, certainly displacement and impacts on production where people can't get from work to home or home to work, resulting in loss of work days and productivity, and an increased risk of hazardous material releases, spills and marine incidents. Um, certainly uh, with the wild weather that's happening around the world, I, I think we're certain to see an increased number of shipping claims, container loss, so on and so forth. And then finally, legal and stakeholders. So, you know, the, the regulatory changes I talked before about the task force on financial disclosure, increasing shareholder demands, and a view really um, that's playing out, particularly in my home in Australia at the moment, um, increased liability in class actions against companies that either don't take action on climate or are proposing to take action on climate but aren't generally or genuinely serious about investing in those changes. I think from an asset life and, and production perspective for the asset managers uh, who are listening to this presentation, it's really this recognition that we may well have designed our assets to a particular design life and climate change is going to move that design life left. It's going to reduce the life of that asset. It may require that asset to be maintained uh, more uh, or, or, or otherwise sort of improved. So we need to consider climate through an asset management lens for both our existing assets, but also how we design um, climate change into our new assets. Now, how do we best respond? Uh, at BMT, we do a lot of work with um, different uh, maritime companies and, and governments themselves uh, around the world on basically a, a three-pass system. The first pass is really working with the company or with the, the government organisation to build their awareness. So how does climate change affect the sites, assets, operations and workforce? Almost a screening level of vulnerability. Um, so there's a knowledge within the organisation of, well, why should I care? How does this affect me and what can I do about it? But invariably out of that first pass, there's a need to look at, well, what really are the likelihood and severity of impacts? And I, I think this is where there's a, 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 a misconception around climate that's a sustainability issue. Um, when we're talking about physical risks, this is very much a risk issue, uh, an economic issue for a company. So what are the likelihood and severity of those impacts? What are the actions that could be taken? Uh, and when will the action be required? Uh, once there's been a prioritization of those risks, you can move to a third pass. Do we need to actively plan and understand the costs and benefits uh, of the resilience measures and implementation? Is, is fixing the problem worse than the problem itself? Um, what are the, the sort of steps along the way we can take to build resilience? So that's just a simple framework for, particularly for a company that hasn't started its journey. Uh, obviously, there's companies, um, you know, around the world that are already in this take action phase, but there's a lot of companies, particularly in our sector, uh, who haven't even started and, and they need to do that first pass. Now, what information is available? Um, there is a growing literature available. Um, it doesn't all need to be bespoke individual studies undertaken by consultancy firms like ours. For instance, um, Singapore is implementing a whole range of coastal resilience uh, plans around the island. You can see the sort of different compartments from a planning perspective it's identified. But it should be important that that you know, the, the, the hazard maps, so the scientists telling you where the hazard's going to occur is only part of the issue. Uh, there needs to be the, the organisational response of, well, if that particular hazard occurs, whether it's sea level rise or a flood or a fire or heat, um, what's the nature of that impact on our business? And then that invariably involves some sort of idea of tolerance. So how much damage am I willing to accept? How much loss of functionality is allowable? 
and that that becomes very a very interesting and important exercise in the context of then being able to to set expectations around well if you're running a port um, how tolerable is a suspension of activities for maintenance um, how tolerable is delays so they become real economic issues just an example of what some of this hazard mapping can look like. Um, this is some very basic mapping uh, in my home state of Queensland, but, but there are tools now um, without much cost and without much effort that can be used based on digital elevation models to understand flooding and coastal impacts and to, to build climate scenarios into that mapping. Uh, so again, a lot of existing information is out there and can be used um, as opposed to just just talking about climate. And just, I won't go through this in detail, but I, I think there's an emerging literature forming on typical port harbour and shipyard physical climate impacts. So if, if you're a company that owns assets on the coast um, or you're accessing those assets, you know, we're, we're starting to see some commonality coming out of all the studies that have happened around the world over the last 10 years to, to understand what, the common impacts are and likewise what, what some of the, the tools are to address those impacts. And they could be for, for extreme weather like, like cyclones and typhoons. It could be for rainfall and flooding, either from the sea or from rivers, uh, from the combination of increased temperature or very hot days. And then the, the ones on the right-hand side there are really around sea level rise. And again, going back to my previous point, it's remembering that it's not new impacts, it's an exacerbation of the impacts we have. So if you own a shipyard or a port that experiences flooding now, it's, it's a very, very high confidence that that flooding is going to get worse in the future. So that consequence assessment is that critical step that really can only be undertaken by the organisation itself. So working with the asset owners, um, with the planners, or with sort of the, the operations manager, uh, of a port or a yard um, or, or a terminal, well, what's the potential damage? What's the loss of use? What's the cost of repair versus replacement? Uh, do I need to review my emergency management and evacuation procedures? Who pays? How will we fund? And when do we need to implement? All those are really important sort of discussions to be had uh, around assessing the risk and what it means to an organisation. And, I, and once you do that, you can develop really quite simple tools around tolerability. And for many of the risks from climate, you know, we're, we're, we're currently in a period of acceptable risk where we're waiting to see what's going to happen or, you know, we're, 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 we're not seeing sort of the local impacts manifest themselves. But we will eventually get to a point where we're starting to see unacceptable risks. And that could be, for instance, um, storm tide consistently overtopping or tides consistently overtopping a seawall uh, or getting sort of saltwater flooding through the drainage system on a side or having, you know, consecutive um, extremely hot days affecting work, worker productivity. So part of the exercise is, is trying to plot a future uh, along a continuum around, well, what are the risks we're willing to accept? When do those risks approach being unacceptable? versus what are the, the risks we're trying to avoid. And, and that's really important when you're talking about, about impacts that are going to be occurring over decadal sort of um, timeframes. Now, as I said, there, there is guidance available. Um, I would point people to PIANC, um, which is, is basically the Port and Waterways uh, and Dredging representative body uh, internationally. Um, they've done a fantastic guideline on climate change adaptation planning for ports and inland waterways. Um, obviously, my firm and myself are very active in this space. We've written the Australian guidelines, but there is, there is work that's been done um, that could be leveraged. And then I, I think, lastly, what I would, would leave the group with is, is while the, the bulk of the concerns the bulk of um, the action is related to risk. There are opportunities for dealing with and being prepared for climate change. And those are really the inverse of some of the impacts. 
So resilience actions that can extend the life and usability of assets. So can we actually understand when those assets need to be replaced and build them back better? We can reduce our ongoing maintenance costs. We can reduce operational downtime and service interruption. We can protect our people on site and reduce workplace stoppages and injuries. And we can guide uh, meaningfully the financial disclosure of risks before it becomes uh, a standard regulatory requirement. And I always take a Darwinian view that really it's the most prepared organisation that will be ahead of their competitors. It doesn't mean that they won't be affected by climate change, but they will have it in hand. That's it for me and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Greg. So this is the MC. Just to inform you, the Q&A session will be during the uh, moderator session. And okay. you can scan the QR code on the table. Or alternatively, you can go to slido.com and enter hashtag climate change to key in your question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Red risk so for delivering the speech. So now I'd like to invite the next speaker, Mr. Francis Lai, business manager with Homson Ships Service, and to the stage. And his topic for today uh, is reduction of emissions from ships with responsible refrigeration. Please welcome Mr. Francis Lai. Okay, um, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Francis Lai and I'm here today to talk to you about how we can reduce emissions from ships with responsible refrigeration. Warmer temperatures lead to more AC and refrigeration and more AC and refrigeration lead to warmer temperatures. Basically, this statement shows that we are being caught in the vicious cycle in which the hotter it gets, the more refrigeration we use. And the more refrigeration system we use, the hotter it gets because refrigeration system contributes to greenhouse gas emission. To break the cycle, can we stop using air conditioning and refrigeration system? It will be extremely difficult. And in fact, with the hotter weather, we are more likely to install even more refrigeration and larger refrigeration to, for comfort cooling and to preserve our food. But then, can we do something now to reduce the emissions from refrigeration system? The answer is yes. And let us discuss more on this in the next 20 minutes. There are two ways how refrigeration system contribute to GHG emissions. Firstly, refrigeration system is one of the biggest consumer of electricity on board. And so it contributes to higher fuel consumption. The second way is the direct emissions of refrigerants through leaks into the atmosphere. According to the studies conducted by the UNEP, the EC and Nordic Council of Ministers, the annual refrigerant leakage in shipping is ranging from 20 to 40%. Compared to residential and office buildings, the leakage rate in shipping is much higher because the ships are exposed to continuous motion on the ocean, which causes damage to the refrigeration piping. And according to the fourth IMO, GHG study, the estimated 
annual refrigerant loss in global fleet amounts to 18.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And the main source of this uh, greenhouse gas emissions is hydrofluorocarbon, HFC. HFCs like R44A has very high global warming potential, GWP. And it is still the most widely used refrigerant in shipping today. With a leakage rate of 20 to 40%, a ship can easily consume one or even more such cylinder on board for system top up in a year. And the impact of one such R44 cylinder equals to the emissions of 38 passenger cars driven for a year. To limit the damage, many regulations have been established to control the use of HFC. And the EU is one step ahead with the F gas regulation. It entered into force in 2015 to phase down the use of HFC by gradually reducing the production and import quota annually. And in 2020, we have also seen the service ban being implemented on HFC with GWP above 2,500, affecting refrigerants like R44A. And in April this year, the EC has released a legislative proposal to update the regulation. And one of the key changes is the acceleration of HFC phase down from 2024, where we may see the current level being cut by half from 45% to 23.6%. Next, we have the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which was adopted in 2016 by 197 UN countries. The countries are being divided into two main groups, the non-A5 countries and A5 countries. For the first group, the non-A5 countries like Canada, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, they have already started the phase down since 2019. And in the beginning of this year, the US have also started the HFC phase down, which has already caused more than 400% increase in HFC prices in US so far. Currently, the total amount of HFC that can be imported and produced in those countries are being kept at 90% from the baseline. And in 2024, this amount will be further reduced by one third to 60%. For the second group, the A5 countries like China and Singapore have already started the preparation and are expected to begin the phase down in 2024 by freezing the HFC consumption to the baseline. Besides the HFC phase down, there are also requirements on leak prevention. And that includes prohibition on venting, refrigerant shall be recovered for recycling, reclamation and destruction, record keeping and leak detection. With so many regulations and changes, what are the consequences of non-compliance? Number one, the global warming and climate change will get worse. As our first speaker, Grace Beach, mentioned. Number two, non-compliance can affect the health and safety of crew and passengers. HFC is odorless, colorless, 
and heavier than air. So in a confined space, it may displace the air and the crew may inhale the refrigerant gas unknowingly making them ill or even lead to unconsciousness. Number three, non-compliance can increase the operating cost. This is because excessive refrigerant loss can damage the system. So the ship owners will then need to spend more money on repair and buy more refrigerants for top up. More importantly, non-compliance can lead to business disruption, penalty fines, or even uh, imprisonment. Now let us look at two recent reports related to this. In 2019, a company was caught violating the US EPA Clean Air Act as they failed to repair leaks of R22 refrigerants from their system. As a result, they received a heavy fine of 900,000 USD. And on top of that, they have spent another 23 million to retrofit all affected vessels. Separately, a company in UK has received uh, it was issued with seven uh, civil penalties, totaling one million pounds for breaching the F-gas regulation. Besides the consequences of non-compliance, what other potential challenges we might face? If we now superimpose the F-gas phase-down schedule with the Kigali Amendment phase-down schedule, we can see that in 2024, the EU may cut the current quota by half. The non-A5 countries like US and Japan, they may further reduce their quota by one third. And the A5 countries like Singapore and China will also start to phase down HFC all in the same year. With this, judging on what has happened in the EU and most recently in US, we are likely to see a significant price increase in refrigerants. And this time, it will not just impact the US and EU, but also other parts of the world, including Singapore. With reducing quota, the ship owners may start facing difficulties obtaining high GWP HFCs like R4-4A after 2024. And thirdly, with the quota system and high refrigerant price, it creates opportunity for the sales of illegal and counterfeit refrigerants at lower prices to unsuspecting businesses. Based on this report by Cooling Post, we can see a steady increase in HFC smuggling as a result of the phase down in the EU and US. These refrigerants are extremely dangerous because they may contain excessive moisture, foreign chemicals, or even banned substances. They can affect the system performance cause failure and danger to the user. Illegal refrigerants also undermine the climate effort to phase down HFCs, and it may increase the risk of HFC leakage through the use of illegal disposable cylinder. So to overcome all these challenges, we recommend the responsible refrigeration R-square approach. The R-square consists of three key steps. The number one is to adopt low GWP refrigerants. 
That means for existing ships still using high GWP refrigerants like R44A, ship owners should start planning for the retrofit and change over to low GWP refrigerants. And in addition, ship owners should insist on using only low GWP refrigerants for all new built ships and new build, a new installation. Ship owners can utilize this new web-based refrigerant CO2 calculator to estimate the amount of CO2 emissions that they can remove from the ship with a selection of low GWP refrigerant. Number two, Minimize refrigerant loss. That means refrigerants shall be recovered before we perform any retrofitting or repair works. The refrigerant shall also be recovered before the end of life of the equipment for the purpose of recycling, reclamation, and destruction. And to further minimize refrigerant loss, we should ensure that leak prevention, leak detection is being carried out. For example, a an handheld leak detector can be used for day-to-day -day check and a fixed leak monitoring system can be installed in walk-in cold room to provide round-the-clock detection. Step three, reduce indirect emission. The refrigeration system can consume as much as 20% more energy with a 10% refrigerant loss. So it is important for us to ensure that the systems are on the, running on full refrigerant charge. On top of that, we should ensure that the systems are being optimized with the correct setting. For example, if the superheat is being set too high, it will affect the system efficiency, resulting in energy wastage. Furthermore, low GWP solutions like R47F, R448A can help to reduce the energy consumption of existing R448 system. So by converting to those low GWP refrigerants, we can reduce emission and save energy at the same time. Lastly, avoid illegal and counterfeit refrigerant. It is important to note that the cylinder label and packaging can be counterfeited. It will be extremely hard for us to identify such refrigerant with a naked eye. So to avoid the risk, we should buy refrigerants from reputable and reliable sources. In summary, um, like our uh, keynote speaker, right, Mr. Saunat uh, Sai has mentioned, there are many options of greener and cleaner fuel. And besides using such um, cleaner fuel, what else ship owners can do to further reduce uh, the emissions from ships? So perhaps the ship owners can start adopting the responsible refrigeration approach. By number one, adopting low GWP refrigerant. Number two, minimize refrigerant loss. And number three, reduce indirect emission. The ship owners will be able to stay compliant with regulation, save time and money, reduce emission from ship and most importantly, help to break the vicious cycle of refrigeration. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Francis Lai for delivering the speech. Okay, so... Now, I would like for the panel discussion for the session one, climate change. Uh, 
I would like to invite uh, our pan our moderator, Mr. Sridip Mukherjee. He is the chairman of Blossom Group, and he is the advisor for the joint branch of Vina and Amares Singapore. So please put our hands together to welcome Mr. Sridip Mukherjee. From Mr. Ramkrishna, that he is asking the keynote speaker was that is Mr. Shanok Rai. So, is there any thought or work going on and using wind energy to power ships while sailing? Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. And uh, yes, a lot of work has been going on on wind energy. Uh, we all need to remember that wind was the sole source of powering ships for a long time for humanity. And the advent of coal and steam engine technology actually put the steam on the backstage, uh, wind on the backstage. But now more and more new technologies are coming, uh, not for sole propulsion, but to increase efficiency of efficiency of propulsion. A uh, lot of new technologies are there and being implemented. So it increases. I mean, reduces the fuel consumption and increases the efficiency in the sales. So, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, the next question which was asked, which I told Mr. Greg, was asked by me what strategies to be in place to increase the resilience? Greg, yeah. can you hear me? I can, yeah. So, so I think I think the the most important strategy to start with is to understand uh, where the vulnerabilities of an organisation are, and and we always start with an, uh, basically a review of basically an organisation's physical assets, uh, their workforces, uh, and their operations, and once we have an idea of of how the business is operating and 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 sort of its footprint of 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 sort of assets and workforce, we can then put that uh, information through an assessment against future climate risks. Uh, and once you do that, um, you can start to develop a risk assessment and a, a, a resilience and adaptation plan. So one of the first things, you know, that I would always recommend to companies is, is sit and, and, and sort of, you know, we, the information's there in terms of the trends. Think, think about how it could affect your business and then incorporate it into your business. Uh, don't, don't deal with it as a, a, a separate issue or a, a sustainability issue because it's going to affect uh, the economics of your business moving forward. Yeah, uh, okay, we got it. And we will now go to the next question. Next question to Shanath. Yeah, the question is, can we comment on the runaway for the four pathways which you are able to meet by 2050 goals? Thank you. That's a very interesting question and a difficult one. Uh, if you look at the each pathway, uh, starting with the, uh, the fuel pathway, uh, there is always already a lot of research being done on biofuel. Uh, the trials are being done here in Singapore also, and also in Europe and US. Uh, the pathway is there. The question is more on how much can you produce. Uh, a lot of times, for the fuel part of it, the fight is with uh, the food industry because uh, the way it is produced, you have competition coming up from food industry. So that needs to be looked into, and that's also very important. Uh, LNG pathway is there, it's ready, already been tested. PMA CGM has tested container vessels with bio LNG and also with e methane synthetic LNG, it's already run. Again, the idea is how can you ramp up the production? Uh, methanol, after Epimola Musk uh, agreed to you know, build uh, or you know, order these new vessels, there's been a lot of discussion and investment on production of green methanol. Again, uh, probably this would come much earlier than uh, green ammonia or green hydrogen uh, because there is a customer available who is ready to pay whatever the price that we will have. 
uh, on the hydrogen pathway uh, right now the first ammonia engine would be is being tested and will be ready to be deployed around 2025 uh, so but that would again be on a gray ammonia basis to use fuel as green ammonia uh, the time when green ammonia would be ready and the toxicities to situation or issues would be solved and there's also an issue of when you use ammonia uh, something which we used to do in when we were very students in school you know we used to make this laughing gas into uh, which is not a laughing matter for environment unfortunately it is a very big uh, impact on uh, greenhouse gases so that is problem is now being solved and how to use or eliminate the production of laughing gas when we are using ammonia i think there are a lot of technical issues and ammonia probably will take a long time uh, the pathway of nuclear technology wise is probably already there but uh, acceptance wise the timeline is very difficult to say because every country every uh, region has its own uh, uh, reservations about using the gas so i hope i answered the question yeah thank you for your answer and we have more questions coming up for you i can see uh, one of the question is does vapor return line you must have the lng monitoring very good question uh, the answer is yes and no uh, it depends on what is the technology used for the cargo tank or the receiving fuel tank of the receiving vessel if the receiving vessel has ttt or type b kind of storage which is like low pressure storage then a vapor return line is a must because the tank cannot take the additional vapor being uh, generated due to the lng bunkering so then the bunker vessel receives that vapor back and put it inside the own cargo tank and use it in its own engine if you have a type c receiving tank uh, like most of the uh, the tankers or the bulk carriers use then it is not a must the tank is able to take the extra pressure generated by the lng bunkering and usually vapor line is not provided for this so it depends on which technology you are using which tank you are using. i think another question to you is uh, all these alternative fuels will eventually play a role however is there any clear direction which singapore is that's a very good question again uh, singapore has made a plan for 2050 there is a blueprint of decarbonization plan and uh, they have provided for every fuel so as we talk lng is fuel is established in singapore there are rules there pr56 is there and it's been converted into a standard uh, mpa is also looking into you know uh, rules for ammonia bunkering that's under development uh they are also doing pilots for hydrogen mpa along with industry partners is developing a network for electrification of harbor crafts so there will be multiple points from where harbor crafts can actually electrically charge themselves so again as i said in the future is going to be a multiverse multi fuel future no one clear winner right now the biggest focus or biggest Uh, available infrastructure for fuel oil and for lng and as we go ahead we see more biofuel we see some ammonia and a massive push for electrification on the harbor craft okay thank you sanak for your answer uh, i have a question for mr greg so you are still there so here yeah. do you want to share the thoughts of the latest ipcc uh, climate science report from insights of it yes thank thanks for the question I, i i think as i sort of identified in in my presentation probably the 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 biggest um change between the previous assessment report which was assessment report 5 and assessment report 6 uh, has to do with sea level rise um so more confidence that uh we will get sea level rises uh, particularly under a sort of uh business as usual um mitigation or emissions pathway we will we will certainly get sea level rises by a meter or close to a meter by 2100 um but one of the big changes was this recognition that major events could actually 
uh, accelerate that sea level rise. So that could be a global polar ice sheet um, falling. It could be a, a change in permafrost. So really what IPCC is saying is that some of those more drastic sea level rise uh, impacts could occur even earlier than 2100. But, but I, I think um, probably the other major change would be around number of hot days. So between the assessments, I think there's been more confidence and we're certainly seeing that in terms of today's weather that we'll see a larger number of hot days. So when I say hot days, days over 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and the concern there is the impact that will have, uh, particularly on workforces, uh, the comfort of workers uh, and, and hours of operation and productivity. Probably not hot enough to start to physically impact infrastructure like you get in the Middle East, uh, but certainly in our, in our region, um, can, can be very uncomfortable conditions um, uh, during summer months that could affect productivity. So th those to me would be the two main changes. Yes, great. Thank you very much. I put it, the next question to you and then we'll go to Francis Lai. Do you see the impact of climate change on the human body? Yeah, I... I, I think the, the, the focus at the moment is, is on uh, and has, has been for years on, on uh, physical assets, uh, on operations. Uh, as I said in my last answer, I, I, I think the physical impacts of climate change on the human body uh, will become a focus. Um, particularly, we're starting to work with health agencies um, and health agencies are trying to understand the trajectory of disease outbreaks, whether they'll be ready for dealing with an increasing number of heat-related illnesses. Um, but, uh, but I think that that focus on health and safety and comfort, in particular to do with heat uh, and disease, they'll become increasingly important issues for, for organisations to deal with, um, since particularly in maritime industries where a lot of our workers are, are outside for a long period of time. Yeah, that's right. Actually, it is stated that this is something ARI, which is the acute respiratory infection, which is supposedly more dangerous than COVID. This is going to happen during the climate change. And do you agree with that one? I don't have uh, a lot of knowledge about that particular illness, but I think generally the, the view, the pervasive view, is uh, under these conditions, uh, we, we'll, we'll see more prevalence uh, of outbreaks. Um, we'll put further risks and sort of uh, further sort of pressures on sanitation systems. Uh, and all of these things are, are pushing towards a less healthy population in the future and greater investment in healthcare and health services. Yeah, okay. The next question, which is for you, would be, can you comment on the financial and operational impacts to ship owners and managers by the legislation rules? Well, the big, uh, it's a good question. The big, the big rule at the moment uh, is not legislating necessarily a target towards decarbonisation. It's only reporting. So in that context, the reporting, uh, to do the reporting properly, the the organisation will need to basically do some sort of risk and opportunity assessment. So that's the risks and costs of decarbonising, uh, the opportunities for decarbonisation and, and what I talked about in my talk around understanding how physical risk could affect the business now and in the future. So it will certainly depend on the business, what, what's their assets, what are their operations, um, what are the costs to, say, decarbonise a fleet or move to, to low carbon solutions or even electrification? But at this stage, the, the real cost of regulation will be they'll have to do a piece of work internally or with assistance to understand and monetize the risks and opportunities. And that's why, you know, we're seeing across the world sort of, um, you know, firms gearing up to help, help businesses to provide those services. Yeah, okay, that's very good answer from you. Uh, I think maybe you are also aware that the Joe Biden has 
appointed one of our fellow members, Dr. Richard, into the committee. Uh, this is a very recent development. Uh, the NOAA Committee of US has appointed our fellow members, Dr. Richard. Maybe Dave Kindred knows him, I don't know if you want to discuss. Yeah, okay, we have one next question to Ms. Shanok. At which point the carbon emissions from LNG fuel need to be addressed and how to do? Will carbon cap capture be necessary? Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, if you see today, uh, and if we look into well to wake uh, emissions, that is emissions from the time you start uh, manufacturing LNG to the time it is used into the ship's propeller and the ship moves, the wake. Uh, LNG uh, has a CO2 emission reduction of 23 to 28%. Again, there is a carbon molecule there, it will be oxidized, so there will be CO2. Compared to fuel oil, compared to MGO, there is a saving, immediate saving of 22-28%. Having a carbon capture on ship is a very good idea. It's been worked on it. The idea is that even whatever CO2 now is left can be captured again and somehow stored on the ship and brought back so that can it be used to make future fuels. All future fuels we were looking at, whether it's green hydrogen, whether it's green ammonia, green methanol or E or synthetic methane, all of them would need this direct air capture or captured CO2. So definitely it's a very good idea. It's a technology being worked in. I think even in Singapore, it's been a lot of being done to, to test this technology out. If Singapore may become being the one of the biggest transit or transit points of shipping here, maybe in place where all this captured carbon can be taken from the ship and stored or utilized somewhere. So very interesting thing. Uh, I think the global GCMD, the Global Center of Nighttime Decarbonization is also looking into doing some pilot studies on this. Uh, what I can say is just keep a lookout. There will be a lot of development in this space. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is what is the carbon budget? That's a difficult one. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, but again, I think there will be more and more investment on uh, reducing uh, the impact and you know, reducing the CO2 emissions and all kinds of impacts. Uh, yeah, but I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number. Actually, while you're looking, I have a question for Francis, if you allow. I saw a very interesting CO2 calculator. Uh, my question is, is it only available for Williamson's customers or is it available to everyone? Okay, yeah. Um, thanks for this question. Um, this is uh, actually a new, uh, we, have, we have seen quite a number of um, CO2 refrigerant calculator available in the market. But there's no, that we could not really find some, something that can really guide the ship owners, right? from uh, a higher GWP refrigerant to a lower option for them to really estimate this. And or it may be very com complex or difficult for them to do that. So this is why we have decided to develop this it's very simple tool. In fact, only very limited uh, information is required from ship owners to key in and to calculate the impact. And this is uh, available on our external website. So it's free to assess and yeah, for everyone. Yeah. Thank, thank, I think that's very good, very much needed. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yes, question to Mr. Francis. People are asking about the counterfeit refrigerants and how to know about it or is it fake? Yes, uh, I think um, this is something that as you can see um, in US and in EU, we can imagine there are the, the rules and regulation and their enforcement sub. Uh, more stringent, right? More strict than Singapore. But yet, we are still seeing so many reports on all this HFC smuggling. So uh, I think that is um, extremely difficult for us to really um, identify this. And we have seen the major manufacturer like you know, Honeywell, those camels, they themselves even have to engage lawyer and to sue all these counterfeiters, right? And and in all these things will drag on for, for years. 
So, uh, and as we mentioned, the, the only way for us to avoid all these um, challenges is to ensure that you are buying only from someone that is reliable and is reputable. So, and if the refrigerant is available at a uh, low price, I mean, un un unbelievable low price, yeah, then you know that, yeah, this could be a counterfeit product. Next question to Francis Lai. Ammonia was referred to as more polluting. How come a zero carbon fuel is more polluting? If you are referring to NOx, have not we have dealt with and dealt with them before? Um, right, and on, on board of sheet, air conditionings are very close, right? I mean, we have air conditioning system, refrigeration piping running everywhere. So the rules and regulation actually doesn't allow the, the the use of uh, ammonia right in, in, in this living space, living quarter. Yeah. The next question, actually there is a question for Greg. Can you comment on the financial and operational impacts to ship? Greg, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I mean, I, I, I think to a, to a ship itself or yeah that's the question yeah i mean i i i think the the really the the financial impact on on ships themselves is going to be the the the, the energy saving devices and the conversion to either uh sort of you know hybrid or electric solutions or alternative fuels i i think the impact of climate on the ship owner is going to be the the, the disruption of all the the physical risks have on shipping and supply chains so that's why the the the, the disclosure sort of regulations that are coming out are looking at both uh, decarbonisation costs as well as physical risk costs. So, and, and really the two intersect uh, in the context of, they're both climate related, but one's looking at improvement of the ship to decarbonise versus how, how climate affects shipping. So the way I always explain it to people is decarbonisation is how you affect the environment, uh, climate adaptation is how the environment affects you. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Greg. And we are running out of time. We try to have a last question on the refrigerant to Francis Lai. Uh, how do you think you will reduce the food to be carried on board, which does not require that much refrigeration, but still it is useful for human being and it is approved? Do you have any idea about it? Um, um, I think um, with this globalization, we are people are expecting right to have food from, for example, uh, Europe available here. I, I would say that um, the needs for all these um, uh, refer container will increase, will only increase. In fact, um, the only way we can uh, reduce the impact of such uh, refrigeration system is, uh, as we mentioned, uh, we have to use low GWP refrigerants. We have to ensure because they are prone to leakage. So we have to really ensure that we are doing leak check, leak prevention. Uh, and finally, yeah, uh, to optimize the system and to reduce the consumption of fuel. I think that, that will be the, the key. Okay, I will add a little bit on this subject, which came up in November in Glasgow. I was privy to the information which is presented by some people who, have, who are my associates. This is the algae green uh, moss, actually. That's what is spirulina. That has been reported to be approved by WHO. It is being used already even in spacecraft to be seen as a food and which does not require refrigeration. It has sufficient amount of vitamins, etc. So this is what is one of the latest things that I learned from November Glasgow conference. So that's all I can share on the subject. I think we are running out of time. We have a few more questions to be answered. I would imagine people can ask the question to the available speakers or us or whoever is available during our break. We now are going to have the break for tea. And I suppose people are waiting to have something. Yeah. With this, we close the session one of today's event.
and we will come back again at 11 o'clock right we have the break from 10 35 to 11 yeah